Hello and welcome to another video on study skills. So in this video I thought I would talk about the idea of deliberate practice and this is an idea that was attributed to uh, Anders Ericsson who's a well-known researcher um, uh, but it, it's gotten a lot of popularity uh, recently because of a book by Malcolm Gladwell. So Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers um, and uh, he mentions some of the research that Erickson and others have done. So if you are interested in this research, you can look at outliers for a kind of a popular explanation. But I think a better explanation uh, would come from looking at some of the research directly. You can actually Google Anders Erickson, go to his webpage, and actually understand the underlying research. And I would actually encourage you to do that more uh, than, let's say, looking at a third-party treatment of that research by people like Gladwell. Because I think certain things are lost uh, when you look at uh, one person summarizing somebody else's work. So together with mindset, I think that deliberate practice is one of the most important pillars of being an effective learner. And in fact, I mean, deliberate practice, as it was initially studied by people like Anders Ericsson and some of his colleagues and even some other researchers, studied people who acquired expert performance in a variety of domains. And these domains include things like chess and music and art and, and uh, sports and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and, but I think that the concepts can be applied to becoming good at any domain, whether it's it's uh, academic or or what have you, uh, and so I, I'm going to describe it in in one context and tell you what deliberate practice is. But I want you to think about how you might be able to apply some of these ideas, even if it's not exactly the precise definition of deliberate practice. I think you can apply some of these ideas to uh, other domains that you might be interested in, specifically towards the idea of being an effective learner. So with deliberate practice, what what Erickson and his colleagues found, uh, and some of the other researchers found, is that the only thing that separated those who became really good or really achieved expert performance at a particular endeavor and those who did not was the amount of time they spent in what he called deliberate practice. And it's pretty remarkable. I mean, they basically show that ideas like talent or ideas like you know natural giftedness in, in some particular domain really didn't pan out in the long run. People who, who might have exhibited a certain degree of quote-unquote talent you know, ultimately um, didn't last long, but the, the real thing that separated people who were really good from, from those who were not uh, was just the amount of time they spent. And I've actually found that true in my own life. If I look at people who in the long run have become really successful at any endeavor, it's because they've spent the most time uh, focusing on that one endeavor. And I think that that's something that uh, when you're younger, you don't get to observe as much or appreciate as much because there are situations in which somebody might achieve a certain level of proficiency in a particular field early on. Uh, and they may be very good for their age, they may be called prodigies and, and so on and so forth. But I've very rarely seen people who, who are uh, really good at a young age translate that into being successful at an older age where performance is measured a bit differently. Uh, and I think that people who do tend to become good at things at a later age uh, did so because they practiced more, but also practiced in the right kinds of ways. Uh, and so there are, um, there are some distinctions between deliberate practice and just kind of random practice. So it's not just about spending a lot of time practicing, but really spending a lot of time practicing in the right kinds of ways. And so with that, let me talk to you about some of the properties of deliberate practice. And these properties are um, ones that were kind of described in an article by Jeff Colvin. And Jeff Colvin it was an editor for Fortune magazine, and he, is, he does a pretty good job of articulating uh, some of the properties of deliberate practice in a way that can be more broadly understood. But I would encourage you to look at some of his writings Look at some of Anders Ericsson's writings and try to understand this topic a bit better. I'm going to give you a high-level overview. And there are a number of properties of deliberate practice. One of the first properties of deliberate practice is that deliberate practice is something that's designed specifically to improve performance. It's not just about, um, you know, if you're playing golf, it's not just about getting on the golf course and hitting the ball around, uh, but rather, uh, for example, doing special drills that would improve your ability. And one example of that is something that actually Tiger Woods apparently used to do. And he would actually go to a golf course, he would take the ball, he would put it in a sand trap where it's already baseline difficult to, to hit the ball out, then he would step on the ball to make it even more difficult to hit out, and then he would practice on that shot, which which if is, is difficult if not impossible uh, to make. Uh, but over time he got better at these types of very difficult shots. So he practiced in a way that was much more difficult than what he was used to. Uh, apparently Michael Jordan did something similar uh, when he would uh, engage in his own type of practice in basketball. And he would uh, practice in a way that was more difficult than what he would encounter in the live game. And so the live game became a bit easier in retrospect. So he would practice in a more intense uh, fashion. 
Uh, another example of that is actually the Chinese table tennis team. Uh, they would actually, when they did their drills, the coaches would actually take a bucket of balls and hit them in rapid succession uh, with different spans and in, in very difficult situations to a single player. Uh, now, obviously, the rate of succession given to the coach had a bucket of balls and was doing this very quickly was much, much faster than what a typical player would encounter in a real match. But as a result, by practicing under these more uh, arduous conditions, the player would then improve his ability, his reaction time. And in many ways, it would be in some sense easier in the actual match to be able to perform uh, well. And so I think that's, that's really the key to deliberate practice. It's not just about practicing, but about practicing in a way that results in you actually getting better and you actually improving. Uh, the second facet of deliberate practice is that it should be around something you can repeat frequently. And, and this makes sense. When you talk about practice, it's not just an isolated endeavor. It's something you, you want to become good at. And to become good at things, you need to repeat those things over and over again. Uh, deliberate practice also has to involve a feedback loop. And, and by that, I mean you have to be able to assess whether or not you did things correctly and, and possibly how you should adjust based on your results. Now, this is something that's maybe easier to do in the context of golf or in the context of a game like chess because you can maybe immediately see your results. And, and maybe chess not as much, but uh, golf certainly, you, depending on how you swing, um, you might notice the ball going in a particular location and you might say, you know what, I need to adjust my swing because the ball didn't go uh, where I wanted it to or in the manner that I wanted it to go. Uh, in fact, I'm kind of reminded of a quote here. And I'm going to um, write it out for you. Basically, this quote um, says that insanity, the definition of insanity, insanity is repeating the same thing over again. Um, and let me actually, it's actually doing the same thing over again and expecting different results. So insanity, the definition of insanity, doing things over again, doing the same things over again. over and over again and expecting different results. doing the same things over and over again, inspecting different. I'm having some trouble with my tablet today, so my results. Okay. Uh, the third aspect, or the fourth aspect, rather, of deliberate practice, it should be something that's mentally demanding. It's not something you can do lightheartedly. It's really something that your mind should be kind of fully engaged in at the time, and, and really um, fully engaged to the extent possible during that type of practice. And, and the corollary of that is it should be very difficult to sustain deliberate practice for very long periods of time. You shouldn't be able to engage in deliberate practice for a whole day. That would be that would imply that you're not really taxing your mind at the level that's appropriate for quote unquote deliberate practice. Uh, probably you can engage in this type of practice for a couple hours at most. Okay. And then the last property of deliberate practice is that it should be difficult. Um, it's it's not about sticking to stuff that you're good at and, and kind of coasting through it, but really about uh, being able to do things that you find difficult, uh, working through them, and that's how you actually get better at stuff. And again, I, I've given these examples in the context of areas like music or chess or sports where there is a notion of performance where you can kind of measure ability, where people typically have coaches who can do things like create drills that improve performance and, and observe and, and help uh, uh, with that feedback loop. But for the most part, you can actually apply a lot of these principles in your day-to-day -day studies in other areas. Like for example, if you are you know, studying math, uh, one thing you can do when you study math is uh, when you read a textbook and let's say you, you encounter a new theorem or a proof or an example, you can try to, uh, before you look at the answer, you can try to work out the answer yourself and then kind of slowly look at uh, the, the actual answer to get hints if you're getting stuck along the way. So in a way, it's, it's actually doing things a bit more in a bit more of a difficult fashion than you were used to doing. Uh, and, and likewise, you can uh, you can take a given problem and, and try a harder version of that problem. In fact, it's funny when I look back on my own learning um, and, and I have a math background. Uh, you know, I found that I learned algebra much better 
and I was much better in algebra after I'd taken calculus, simply because uh, in calculus you had to do, uh, oftentimes the, the underlying principle of calculus weren't complicated, but when you got to some kind of algebraic equation that uh, that resulted, you know, you'd have some, some complex polynomial that you might have to take a derivative of. It was in applying the actual algebra uh, at the end where, uh, you know, th that was actually much more challenging than the typical algebra you saw uh, when you took an algebra class. And so as a result, I got much better at algebra after taking calculus because I was forced to do much more complex problems involving algebra. Uh, and I think that's true in general. When you start to do things that kind of push out of your comfort zone that are a bit more difficult, that's really how you get better at things. You can't get get better at something if you uh, don't try to engage in a type of practice that's suited towards getting better. But the the most amazing thing I think of all of this is that, um, and, and this is something that Erickson has shown repeatedly, that his colleagues have shown repeatedly, that other researchers have shown repeatedly, is that if you engage in that level of deliberate practice and you do it for the right amount of time, you will become good at anything. That there, there, most things are skills. There's very few, or or there's a lot less room for talent, if you will, or, or natural ability in most endeavors. If you're willing to put in the time and the effort and practice in the right kinds of ways, then you can become good at, at almost uh, anything you can imagine. And I think that's a very empowering thought. And to me, that's something that you should really keep in mind as you embark on any endeavors related to learning. Uh, thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed this video and I look forward to making some more on study skills.